Thank you. One of the things that impresses me about Canadians is your respect and your reverence for this, I don't want to call it a holiday because it feels like it's you know something we're celebrating, rather observing, this observance of Remembrance Day. Canadians begin wearing their red poppies weeks before the day of Remembrance Day in a show of regard for the memory of those who died in service in defense of their country. I heard a story, as a matter of fact, it was at the uh, casino and there was this little lady who was working a shift and none of, her knew, uh, none of us knew her, but she just was giving her time in, in support of whatever was going on. And she was telling a story, a true story, about a young Canadian boy who says to his dad, asked him to pick up a poppy for him. And the dad said, okay, well, how much do you want me to put in a, a, a loony or a toonie? And the little boy said, dad, it's for veterans put in a $10 or something like that. So that's the energy that you have here in Canada when it comes to this idea of Remembrance Day. We have similar days to this in the US. Uh, we have one that's called Memorial Day and that's usually, uh, or not usually, it is at the end of May and its idea is to honor those who have lost their lives in a war. And then we also have Veterans Day, which is the same as this Remembrance Day. It's on November 11th, and it, it honors all people who have served in the armed forces at any time. And all of those observances are solemn, they are respectful, they are meaningful. And for some reason, the wearing of the poppies and the tie-in to that beautiful poem in Flanders Fields that Reverend Marjorie read, there's something that makes it especially poignant, at least to me. So what I would like to ask is if we can just take a moment, just a moment of silence in memory, in remembrance. As most of you know, this holiday was uh, originally called Armistice Day, and it was named so at the end of World War I. And I thought Armistice, you know me, I, if I don't understand something, I look it up on the internet, right? The, the knower of all things. And uh, the, uh, the Armistice, I thought that was the end of the actual war, that, that's when peace was declared, but that's actually not true. And Armistice means a truce. It means a ceasefire, it means a suspension of hostilities, but it is not the official end of a war. An official end of a war requires a peace treaty, which is the perfect segue to my talk called Poppies for Peace. Because as beautiful and as poignant as this observance of Remembrance Day is, what most people really want is an end to war. What people want is peace. What we want is that all the sons and daughters and all the husbands and wives and all the, the mothers and fathers of the world would never again have to give that ultimate sacrifice in, in, in a conflict that in most cases they didn't have anything to do with. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. Yes, indeed. What we know, what we know about how the universe works is that in order, though, to have peace on the outside, in the world of effect, we need to first have peace on the inside. I want to share with you a quote from Jawaharlal Nehru, who was a, 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 a peer of Gandhi. And he said, peace is not a relationship of nations. It is a condition of mind brought about by a serenity of soul. Peace is not merely the absence of war. 
It is also a state of mind. Lasting peace can only come to peaceful people. So that's actually my topic for today, inner peace, which then leads to global peace. Because I want you to think about this for a second. If we had a world full of people who were truly peaceful in their hearts, there wouldn't be any need for domination or hostilities or aggression or defensiveness. Everybody would just get along. How cool does that sound? Because when we are peaceful, we can truly look at others with the eyes of love, look at others with the eyes of peace, and accept them for who they are. When we are truly peaceful, we can see the divine in everyone, that spark. Even those people that we're in conflict with. Now I realize that this is a hard topic sometimes because sometimes if somebody appears to be out to get us or trying to harm us or trying to harm our loved ones, either it's a person or it's a person, a group of people, it's difficult to be peaceful and loving in the face of aggression and dominance. As human beings, we have a natural fight or flight mechanism that will either cause us to run away from conflict or to stand and fight. The problem is that is how mankind has been operating in conflict for thousands of years and let's face it, it doesn't work. Fighting leads to more fighting. Anger leads to more anger and war leads to more war. Doesn't it stand to reason then that the opposite would also be true? That love leads to more love and peace leads to more peace? Ernest Holmes said this, love begets tolerance and tolerance begets understanding, which is being able to put oneself in the other person's place and see why he acts as he acts, why he does what he does. Thus, love can create a better world in which to live. It is the one power which can and must bring peace to a changing world. Now you may be thinking, well this is all very well and good, but you don't know my spouse. You don't know my boss. You don't know my coworkers. You don't know my neighbors. You don't know my mm -mm -mm. If you knew them, you would be angry and defensive too. And you know what, I get that. I am not holding myself out as the great peacemaker. I get my knickers in a bunch, just like anybody else. However, I am committed to living a peaceful life. I am committed to living my life in a spiritual manner. So I strive, even in the face of those things, I strive to remember, to rise above, to transcend that human tendency to lash out. And I strive to choose a more peaceful response. And sometimes I'm successful, and sometimes I'm not. But it doesn't keep me from continuing to work at it. And the reason for that is, folks, we are evolving beings. Do you understand what I mean by that? I don't mean we're evolving so that we're going to grow second toes or anything like that. But we are evolving in consciousness, both as individuals and as a species. For thousands of years, our way of dealing with conflict has been to get pissed off and go into, go into war with somebody else. But most of us are waking up and we're wanting to make the world a better place. We're wanting to make a world that works for everyone. Most of us are starting to see that choosing a different way of dealing with conflict is what needs to happen. I recently heard a definition of conflict that I'd never heard before and kind of blew my mind. It was, it was really 
cool. Conflict has nothing to do with war or fighting. This definition of conflict is simply that it is a difference of opinion. The difference of opinion. And the truth is everybody has an opinion, right? Everybody has one and sometimes they're bound to be different than ours. But what happens though, how the conflict happens, is that most of us are really, really addicted to being right. <laughs> Nobody here, but we're addicted to being right, so we see this conflict, we see what is simply a difference of opinion, and we see that as an invitation to get angry or to get aggressive or to get defensive about something. But what if we tried it differently? What if we tried to be understanding, oh, you believe that? I mean, inside you may be going, oh, really? But outwardly, this is your opinion. This is what you believe. What if we allowed others to simply have their opinion, their belief, or their position? Of course, in Miracles says, would you rather be right or happy? Would you rather be right or happy? Another way of putting it is, would you rather be right or at peace? Here we go like this. Wait. Go like this. At peace. There's a wonderful book that we use sometimes in our curriculum called Working with the Law, written by Raymond Hollowell. And, and in the book, he writes about the law of sacrifice. And when I first read it, I was like, I am so sure. I don't believe in sacrifice. I believe in abundance. I believe in my good coming to me. I can't possibly believe in sacrifice until I learned what it was. And the law of sacrifice basically states that something lesser has to be sacrificed in order to allow something greater to be known or experienced. Something lesser has to be sacrificed or let go of to make room for something greater. Here's a silly example, but it illustrates what I'm talking about. Um, I love to sleep in. I love it, I love it, I love it. It's, it's my nature, especially on cold mornings, you know. But what I also want is to be healthy and to live a long life. And so if I want to be healthy and fit, I need to sacrifice an hour of sleep so that I can do the exercise that I need to do before starting my day, right? So for me, the lesser idea is more sleep although I love it, and the greater idea is a healthier body, which leads to a healthier mind, which leads to a healthier and happier life. Another example. You didn't know I was going to use you as an example, Michelle. Do you know that Michelle Gregoire, our piano player, is a world-class musician? Do you know that she is considered just the... the the essence of jazz piano and, and the things that you, so we get to hear her, we get to listen to her, but we have no idea the number of hours that she sacrifices in order to become as proficient as she is. But for her to be at the top of her game as a musician is the higher idea. So she is willing to let go of lesser activities to attain the greater. And the truth is we're all doing it and we're doing it all the time. We just don't think of it as being a sacrifice. We let go of things all the time, right? You just think about, well, this is a choice I'm making. But the energetic principle is the same thing. Releasing a lesser idea or activity allows something greater to be known. So maybe it's the time that we let go of being right or being attached in order to know something or allow something greater, like peace of mind. Maybe it's time for us to, to hold on to our, I don't want to say principles, never let go of your principles, but your attachment to being right. Would you rather be right 
Or would you rather be happy? Would you rather be at peace? When those soldiers who sacrificed their lives during World War I that brought about the armistice, they were doing what they were doing because they believed the world could be a better place. For them, it was a noble cause. They did it for love of country and freedom. So, of course, we honor and remember them. How did you put it, Marjorie? We, we don't glorify it. We remember it. But don't you imagine that every one of those men and women, after having seen the ravages of war, would have preferred a different path to make the world a better and safer place. My own father was a career military man. He was in three wars, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. And yet, in spite of that, instead of that being his career all of his adult life, he became a peace lover in the end of his years. He raised four peace-loving children as well. Because what he experienced in those wars, as he matured, he recognized the futility of fighting over conflicts, differences of opinion. What's happening is that many of us are spiritually maturing as well. And we're beginning to see that Fighting and aggression and defensiveness is not the greater good. Peace is the greater good. It has to be. <clears throat> because the alternative these days is too damn scary to think about. What's happening, though, thank you God, is that people all over the world are beginning to wake up to this. Not everybody, not everybody, but the tide is changing. The tide is changing, I am affirming that. The tide is changing. People are beginning to understand that we are all connected, that we are all part of us, so what harms one is harming everyone. We're starting to recognize that fighting and war is not the answer. We are evolving. Thank you, God. Amen. Thank you. So I want to close with a poem that has actually been attributed to a whole bunch of different people, including Buddha and Sai Baba and A Course in Miracles. Whoever it said it, it was a dandy, and um, um, Larissa and Femi, you're going to recognize this because we used it last week also for baby blessing. When there is love in the heart, there is beauty in the person. When there is beauty in the person, there is harmony in the home. When there is harmony in the home, there is order in the nation. When there is order in the nation, there is peace in the world. I love the Sanskrit saying of Namaste, which means the divine in me honors the divine in you. Namaste. I love you. And so is